Tampa, Orlando. Will Jim Jeffries be performing there this week? The podcast is coming out. Well, you might find out, and I don't know about that. With Jim Jeffries, Jack Hackett, and Kelly, and Forrest, and Louise. It's the week after. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, then you just found out. You just found out. <laughs> that's true. That's true. February 11th and 12th. Le- February 11th and 12th, I'm going to be in Tampa and Orlando. I think it's Orlando first and Tampa second. Am I correct? I think that sounds right. Um, and yep. and uh, yeah, looking forward to those gigs, man. A lot of people yeah. ask me if I'm doing them with you because I'm from Florida, but nope. No, who have I got? Don't know. I'm not. I'm not there. Though. I know that. Um, so uh, some yeah. of you know. We'll be yeah. There. So we're going to be out there. We're going to be doing all this It'll stuff. Be Justin and Whitehead. I will we'll be at Disneyland with ears on. <laughs> Don't you worry about that. <laughs> Disney. Yeah, we'll be off uh, having fun. So uh, yeah, come and come and see us out there. I think there's um, still tickets available for both. I'm looking forward to coming. We just did Kansas and Des Moines. Best shows I've ever had. They were wow. fantastic. Yeah, I was there. Oh, the audiences were good. Yeah, yeah. remember I did the, I did the thing. Yeah, yeah and so this is <laughs> so uh, a reminder again. We have the Patreon now. That I believe. Tell me if I'm right. You get episodes yep. without ads. Yep. You get extra episodes. Yep. Yeah. So so the tiers start as low as two dollars a month. Uh, at that tier, you can get all of these episodes without ads and you can still listen to them via Spotify or I, Apple podcast or whatever. You can just update your RSS feed. So we are going to be still doing free episodes here where you normally listen to podcasts and we're doing little promo clips and commercials for Patreon because we want you to know what you might be getting. We're doing extra episodes. Now look at that. Uh, 50 cents, less than 50 cents an episode ad free. So I don't want to hear anyone fucking complaining about the ads going too long. <laughs> I've just offered you ad free for yeah. less than 50 cents an episode. Yeah. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we need to pay for all this equipment somehow, guys. <laughs> so patreon.com slash IDCAT. And then don't forget to follow us on Instagram at IDCAT podcast. Um, and yeah. Are we ready for the, our guests? Yeah, let's, mm-hmm. let's meet our guests. Okay, please welcome our guests today, Steve Murphy and Javier Pena. G'day, guys. Now it's time to play. Oh. Okay, that was a good one, Jack. We'll put that in post. Yeah, Jack, <laughs> Jack has one bloody job. And, he, <laughs> the and, song didn't and the way that Jack pressed the button, <laughs> and, then he, and then he stepped away like, and here it Voila. goes. <laughs> and now, now he's walking off in his cowboy boots with his tongue in his lip like he's fucking dabbing tobacco. Get out of here. <laughs> All right, well, um, <laughs> thank you, Steve everyone. Murphy and Javier Pena. G'day, guys. Thanks for being on the podcast, first of all. Uh, I, I Look, I know what subject this is already. What? It's moustaches. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good <laughs> subject. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll ask a quick question. Uh, I assume you two know each other. Um, are you guys, uh, do you work in sports? No. No, no okay. Uh, do you work in science? No. no. Oh, okay. I'll give you a hint. Law enforcement. Do you work in law enforcement? <laughs> <laughs> no. Not any longer. Not any longer. Okay, so these guys, this is the FBI. Maybe. Ask them. Oh, Ask why, them why, well, well, why would you insult us like that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is the Moto Highway Patrol guys. <laughs> they, they deal specifically in something that you used to really enjoy. Well, it, the, it's tangentially related to something that you used to really enjoy. Oh, are you the drug enforcement officers? They are. They, that's, right. they used to work in the DEA. I don't. But yeah. more specifically, so they're, the subject we're talking about is something that they were involved with within that. Oh, um, smuggling drugs up your ass. <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> How'd you know? It's a dirty job. <laughs> They're here to teach you how to do it, Jim. So, uh, <laughs> We've already learned how to get a knife up your ass. Now we get drugs. Uh, um, it's a specific person that they were involved in. Oh, oh, um, uh, Pablo, uh, Pablo Escobar. Yeah, I was going to say ah, you may have seen them, uh, a version of them on Netflix. So, uh, when, when, whenever I'm fat, people think I, I look like, which is now, uh, <laughs> which is people think I look like Pablo Escobar from the Netflix series. The actor. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, people send comparison that's pictures. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he looks shockingly like here. a soccer dad, and you find out how many people he killed. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Let me introduce him. Uh, well, Steve Murphy and Javier Pena both worked as special agents with the Drug Enforcement Administration, targeting the world's first narco terrorist, Pablo Escobar, 
and his cartel, living and working alongside their Colombian National Police counterparts, as well as with the elite U.S. military units. Their efforts resulted in the dismantlement of the largest and most violent international drug trafficking organization of its time. Um, and this was the first in their field of international narcotics investigations. U.S. and international law enforcement agents Sees continue to utilize many of the strategies and innovative ideas that were created and implemented by Steve and Javier. They have a website, deanarcos.com. Please go there, check that out. There are books available on that website, including Manhunters, How We Took Down Pablo Escobar is the only place to get an autographed copy of that book. If you live outside of the U.S., US it can be Did ordered. Pablo autograph a lot of them? Or? <laughs> I think it's these two. I think it's Steve and Javier autographed it, but I'm not sure. Um, you know, uh, and if you live outside the US, you can also order it on eBay, but also go to that website. There's tour information on there, and they have a weekly true crime podcast called Game of Crimes. Go to gameofcrimespodcast.com. Is there anything else? I mean, I didn't give your full bios as two of you two have kind of combined it together, but maybe if you want to say a few minutes without giving away any of the answers to Jim about how, like just, uh, just a background and yeah. You did pretty good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. you covered it very well. Yeah. I kind of plowed through it, but I think we did. All right. Well, we, we, we'll talk to you more about it. So this, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask Jim a series of questions. There's a bunch of questions in here. I, I, um, I'll ask him a lot of these. We're going to see what his answers are. We'll see if he gets things right or wrong. And at the end of these, asking these questions, I'm going to get back to the two of you and you're going to grade him zero through 10, 10 being the best on his knowledge of Pablo Escobar. Um, All right, now, I think you assume that I'm going to do okay at no, this. No, I'm not saying you're going to do okay in this I, one. No. I don't know a lot. I, I enjoyed the drug of cocaine. I, I just don't know the farm to tableness. Did you? Did, <laughs> of it, you know what I mean? Like, like I, I um, it's the same as like when I get meat. I'm eating a hamburger. I don't know where the cow was or what machine it's been put through or what farm it was on. I don't yeah. know anything like that. Um, okay. And then, so after you're going to grade them zero through 10 on B harsh, 10 is the best is yours. The worst Kelly's going to grade them on confidence zero through 10. I'm going to grade them on, et cetera. We'll combine all those scores together. And if you get zero through 10, which is not good, you'll be Pablo Esco barbarian <laughs> 11 through 20 Pablo sports bar. Mm hmm. 21 through 30, Pablo Lumbar support. That's sure. your best one. <laughs> yeah. The Lumbar support. That's your best grade. Yeah. All right. Here's the first question. Uh, who is Pablo Escobar and what uh, was he known as? He, he was uh, he, he was a cocaine dealer of, of the, a big proportion. <laughs> um, and he from a town called, I believe, Medellin, 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 Medellin. And all the locals loved him. That's what I know. They all thought, ah, oh, he's all right. Him. He puts a bit of money into the town, you know what I mean? But he's was responsible for a, a huge percentage of the cocaine well, in America. Well, there's questions about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So, so where do you live? You said Med Medellin. Me um, okay. Yeah. What was the name of his cartel? Um, oh, oh, God, I fucking know this. Okay, um, let's ask you the next question. When was the Medellin cartel founded? It was something that would have been, if I, movies, let me correct, uh, early 80s. And like, how did he get into this? Like, how did his criminal activity start? Like, what did he, how did he start? Like, he didn't just become. Well, the, the first biggest. thing he did was he, in a news agency, he stole a stick of gum. Right? And then he <laughs> thought, oh, I felt bad about it. But then he thought, Oh, it wasn't that bad. And then he went and stole his Snickers and then it escalates and then he's growing cocaine. I, mean, I, I, wow. I, saw, I saw, saw a movie with Tom Cruise. I'm sure these guys were involved with that one. Where Tom, American Made. American Made. It was a great movie and I think it got sort of buried because yeah. it was made by Harvey Weinstein right before Harvey Weinstein. Wow. Do you guys know that movie, American Made? The, that, were you, yep. Yep. Is that something Very you guys well. were involved in too as well? No, no. no. We, we weren't involved with a great movie, yeah. Yeah, good <laughs> movie. it was a really good movie and just got no airplay. Mm -hmm. Um, but yep. anyway, so so that was so gum, set, candy bar cocaine. That was set in the 80s. Okay. So Pablo Escobar wasn't originally the top bloke. He was one of the sort of there was four blokes, but I think he was the most um he he got shit done type of a okay. guy. Like if you want someone bumped off, he, he did it. When was Escobar first arrested and for what? Um, well, it depends what you, what for drugs? For the gun. Oh yeah, yeah. He, was, he, was, he was arrested for speeding in 1976. Okay. Uh, no, no, he was, uh, for, I don't know. I don't know. He first arrested, I would say in the nineties and it would have been for drug trafficking or tax evasion. Okay. Um, at his peak, how much money did Escobar make weekly? Weekly? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to say he made 15 million a week. 
15 or 50? 50. Okay. 50. <laughs> uh, you kind of said, talked about this. Why I was Escobar seen as Robin Hood type? You mentioned he gives money. Yeah, we'll, people, we'll talk, we can talk the about local, that. The locals adored him. Not, to, probably not all of them, but, can, you know, but, but a vast majority of the locals yeah, liked him. We can talk about it. What is La Cathedral? Um, it's a, cathedral, it's yeah. a dish that you start with citrus <laughs> and then you put shrimp in there and I call it a cocktail. <laughs> Okay. The, the <laughs> next question kind of answers that. Though. So I'll ask it and we'll talk about it with the guys. Um, when did Escobar surrender to the government? Um, well, he had dinner with Sean Penn first. <laughs> That's what I remember. You're not going to know the answers to any of these. <laughs> yeah. right, right, here's a question that you were trying to answer. Escobar supplied at least blank percentage of the world's cocaine market. <laughs> Sits up in the chair. All right. 38%. 38%. Yep. Okay. That's a lot. Um, I'm going to skip over some of these. We'll get to all these. How did the government and DEA agents track Escobar? Um, find my phone. <laughs> <laughs> With an iPhone, really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, they, would have, they would have had spies in there. They would have had people on the inside that were, you know, you know, like Javier, people that would have joined in and then they. Steve and Javier? Not yeah. Steve. Uh, you can't fucking be in I Pablo called, Escobar's uh, group uh, called uh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and Pablo would have gone, there we go. Uh, Luis, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> no, Javier got in there a bit. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, what is notable about Avianca Flight 203? Um, that was a, a, a smuggling plane. Okay. What is Plato o Plomo? Plato o Plomo? Or are you the, saying? The, the, the phrase, Plato o Plomo. O means or, just so you know. Plato o uh, Plomo. Death or life. Okay. I don't know. You're doing great. I don't speak Spanish. Man. No, I know, but I thought, I thought you maybe watched Narcos. Or I never know. watched Narcos. Oh, oh okay. I thought you did. It's a great it's show. A great yeah. show. Yeah, yeah, I was watching The Toys That Made Us. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, ask, we'll ask, I'll get to all these questions, but I'm going to ask two or three more, and then we'll start talking to our guests. Um, how many deaths do they estimate Escobar is responsible for? Oh, uh, 2,000. Here's a question. I don't know. This is this, this, we know is, that, is that counting drug overdoses or just ones that he had people? No, pop I think violent. Yeah, just violent. Violent. violent yeah, yeah, two thousand. Like, like the cartel would have killed. Two um, I don't know. Do we know the answer to this? How much did he spend on rubber bands I do. a month? Oh, because For you have money, to roll yeah. all the money up, and well, also if I know anything about Pablo Escobar. Him and his friends, do they? <laughs> 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 uh, you haven't sold enough drugs. <laughs> oh. okay. You see one with a lot of welts in his forearm. Pablo was very angry at that guy. Uh, I want to say on rubber bands, he spent uh, five grand a month on rubber bands. Here's it. We did a question on cocaine. We did an episode on cocaine trafficking before, and this got brought up. Escobar had a zoo. What is going on with that today? Okay. Well, what happened with the zoo is right because uh, he. He, it's Columbia, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So in Columbia, I mean. they never had uh, hippos, right? Mm -hmm. But right. what happened was you remember something from the past. Yeah, what That's happened was they, 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 when they busted him and ruined everything, the animals just got let free. And the hippos. They, were, they ruined everything? Yeah. It was fucking crazy. <laughs> they, ruined it. they ruined it for him. Game yeah. prices <laughs> went up. I know when these guys were doing their job. <laughs> anyway. So, so the hippos, they got released and then they've been fucking, and now it's, it's the biggest population of hippos outside of Africa. Okay. I know he knew that, but it, it, don't give him a lot of points for that. So yeah. understand. No, what? What? Two, because I knew something? Two more questions. Two more <laughs> You're questions. You're not allowed to know anything <laughs> yeah. on this. Yeah. That was learnt things. <laughs> two more questions. Well, I know. I don't want to be like, well, you knew the hippos. You get an eight. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how did he die and when? Um, how did he die? He got. He got caught and arrested not that long ago. Uh, and I remember the footage of him going out of the bathtub, like where he's locked in prison and he lifted up the bath. So I want to say he got he got killed by Steve <laughs> on uh, six years ago. <laughs> six Steve. years ago. <laughs> Steve was running around Columbia six years ago. I'm not, I'm not saying you couldn't have, but brass knuckles. He never gives up on a case. You guys didn't hear, you guys didn't hear about the 2017 killing of Pablo Escobar? Okay, last question. Trump took him down. Oh, no, it wasn't Trump. Uh, okay, okay, last question. How many people attended his funeral? Okay, this is going to be a trick question because I'm going to go thousands because he was so beloved, but then at the end he was caught and killed and all that other stuff. So I'm going to say, uh, or may maybe he was in prison. I'm going to say six people. 
Six people. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Steve and Javier, uh, how do you think Jim did answering these questions on Pablo Escobar? Zero through 10, 10 the best. <laughs> Well, just so you know, I retired nine years ago. So him getting killed six years ago, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> he did pretty good. Uh, some of them were a little way off, but some were, you know, in the ballpark. Mm, you're yeah. very nice, yeah. Javier. Very nice. Yeah. Um, so where do you think, like a uh, six, seven, on ten, zero to ten? Where are you going to put him? Uh, Four? I'd say let's give him let's give him a five. Yeah, five. I, I five would be nice. Yeah, I think five. Right, that's very nice as well. Very, nice. very generous. All right, We're nice people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> they, I was... these two, if they interrogated you, you just go, oh, I'll be fine. <laughs> <They're> too friendly. <laughs> that's why it took so long to capture him. These two kept on interrogating him like this, going, "Come on, Pablo, tell us where the drugs are." <laughs> Be nice. Just be nice. Uh, I, w- I was originally giving, gonna give him a two on confidence, but he was like an eight on the hippo thing. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna give him a four on confidence. Yeah, okay. Bump so him up 13, a little bit. I'm gonna give him a two. So you're a Pablo sports bar. Yeah, man. <laughs> pretty good. All right. Uh, who is Pablo Escobar? Well, let's uh, let's do some ads. First, oh, I'm sorry. And we'll come right back. Do some ads. If you pay for the Patreon, you wouldn't have to listen to this. <laughs> and- have you ever uh, browsed the incognito mode? It's probably not as incognito as you think. And why would it be? Chances are the browser you're using has made its fortune by tracking your movements online. And what do these big tech companies say when they're called out for collecting user data? They say, oh, incognito doesn't mean invisible. That's what they say. I've never spoken to them, but I assume. <laughs> so how do you actually make yourself invisible as possible online? You use. Express VPN like ooh, I ooh. do. Turns out that even in incognito mood, your online activity still gets tracked and your data brokers still get to buy and sell your data. One of these data points in your IPS address data, is your IP address. Oh, one of the one of the data points is your IPS address. Ooh. Uh, data harvesters use your IP to uniquely identify up uh, you and your location. But with ExpressVPN, your connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server and your IP address is masked. That is a big deal. Yeah. Every time you connect to ExpressVPN, you get a random IP address shared by many other ExpressVPN users. That makes it harder for third parties to identify you or harvest your data. So when you're Googling those questionable things, mm. use ExpressVPN. Yep, 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 yep. Best of all, ExpressVPN is super easy to use. No matter what your device, you're on phone, laptop, or smart TV, all you have to do is tap one button for install protection. Uh, so if, you're, if you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash I don't know and get your three extra months for free. That's three extra months. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash I don't know. Uh, go to expressvpn.com slash I don't know to learn more. Hey, honey. How are you doing? Hey, I wasn't talking to you, but I like the response. (laughs) I'm talking about Honey, the money-saving app. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey. We all shop online. We've all seen that promo code Phil taunt us at checkout. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is a free shipping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one and finds it for your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. They range from sites from tech, gaming, lobster, uh, to popular fashion brands, uh, brands, and even food delivery. Oh, food. (laughs) Uh, Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites, right? So, Jack, you're on cowboy hats and and, uh, (laughs) and those bowlers, right? (laughs) Feather necklaces. Yeah, yeah, feather necklaces. You're on you're on uh, gratefuldeadtshirts.com, right? <laughs> you're on that site. Imagine you're shopping on any of those sites. When you get to checkout, the honey button drops down, and all you have to do is click apply coupons. Whoa. He was sort of doing a thing. He was like, hey, imagine Jack and the girls are on your, on your favorite sites, and then we're back. All right. Yeah, I'm trying to get back in. I'm an ad man. Oh, yeah. Wait for, wait for a few seconds as Honey reaches for the coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. Kelly Bear or Forrest, you been using Honey lately? Yeah, I use it every time I shop. I I just bought 
recently because Luis tweeted about wanting some, and I've been thinking about pulling the trigger for. I mean, these are. I just can't say products. I just. Oh, okay. I bought shoes recently. No, 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 no. You, you bought rubber shoes with a rubber thing on the back. <laughs> I that, bought ugly that, rubber shoes. Yeah, you lately. bought ugly rubber shoes that nurses that really like to wear and Ron Jeremy's favorite footwear. Yeah, <laughs> bought those, saved some money. But also, like I, we were talking about maybe last year on one of these ads. One of the favorite parts of it is that every time you shop, you get points to your bank that you get to use for money after too. So it's like you're doubling up on. It's automatic. On free money. It's just yeah. once you install it in your browser, it automatically comes out. So I got all like, my friends on Honey. We're all Honey heads. Yeah. This is the one thing you don't have to purchase <laughs> at all. It just puts more money back into your pocket. So get Honey. I bought wood. They're all Honey heads. I don't know. It just, it just came to me. I, don't yeah, know. Yeah, I yeah, mentioned yeah. it before. I bought wood and I, it, it saved me a lot of money. When, I'm not lying. I bought wood from a place you'd buy wood from. And it was like, it knocked like $70 off the wood. Ooh. Mm, wood. So there's I some assume wood Jack's household has an ant problem. <laughs> <laughs> Honey has found it's over 17 million members, over two billion dollars in savings. If you already have Honey, or if you don't already have Honey, you're just throwing money away. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you're doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. I'd never recommend something that I don't use. I recommend Jack. Go, get Wait, honey. Because <laughs> <laughs> I use Jack. Uh, I get honey. Uh, well, you, you will as well. You get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash IDK. That's joinhoney.com slash IDK. And we're back. And we're back. All right. We're here with uh, Steve Murphy and Javier Pena. And we are about to get to the questions here. So, who is Pablo Escobar? Jim said a cocaine dealer of big proportion. From Medellin. Uh, the locals loved him. He put a bit of money in the town. And I also asked you, what was he known as? His nickname. I don't think he answered. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, um, his nickname was Shorty. Because okay. he was medium height. <laughs> can, you, can you give us a better description, uh, Javier and Steve, of who Pablo Escobar was and who he was known as and so on, his nicknames? and Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, JP. Yeah, he, he was the number one uh, trafficker in the world, responsible for 80% of the cocaine that was Whoa. reaching the world. He was the first narco-terrorism trafficker in the world because of all the violence that are used. But uh, like I said, his empire, I mean, you know, 80% of the cocaine that was reaching the world, that was Pablo Escobar. Mm, I thought eighty percent of the cocaine in the world was baby laxative. <laughs> <laughs> you've been you've been snorting some bad stuff. <laughs> um, okay, and so what, what was he? I said, what was he known as? I know he had a couple names. He said the shorty. Is that? I don't think that's right. Uh, that's that would be El Chapo with the Mexican cartels. Uh, El Chapo uh, is the one that bloody uh, Sean Penn visited that went uh, out of the bar. Uh, that's why you said Sean Penn. I, I wonder why confused. you said Sean Penn. Oh, I've been yeah. messing up with El Chapo. <laughs> yep, he's coming for you. Yeah. Is he dead? El Chapo. No, he's in prison oh. here in the U.S. Ah, oh, you knew he's caught. Yeah, all right. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think Pablo Escobar, El Patron, right? Or Don, Don Pab Pablo. Don Pablo would be, yeah. Don Pablo. Yeah, a lot of names. And what, is Don, what does Don Pablo mean? Luis? Just a term of respect. Like right. a Don, you know, like even the mafia there. What does Pablo be. mean? Pablo Escobar. Oh, <laughs> you're doing great on this, I guess. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah. So, is it my nickname? Can we, Don Jim. Can we change our score now? <laughs> can we change our score. I have a feeling that's going to be a clip. The, po the podcast isn't called I Know About That. I know. But, uh, it's Pablo Escobar we're talking about. What is Pablo? Where does it come from? <laughs> <laughs> I look at uh, Luis like he was, yeah, he's going to tell me. Um, <laughs> I asked you where he lived. You, you said you tried to say Medellin. You were close. You got it. I think yeah, that's fine. Um, and that was the name of his cartel, the Medellin cartel. But what, so when was the like, Medellin cartel founded and maybe some of the history of like how he got into that? Okay. It, it, it was founded in the uh, early 80s. So you are correct on that one, early 80s. And, and you're right. He was one of four other traffickers, but Pablo always was the CEO, but he had, a, like I said, a, a three other traffickers working, but he was always the CEO. So that, that was correct when you said in the early, uh, early eighties, but uh, again, he, Pablo make no mistake was the boss of the other three. There's 
actually four other major traffickers, but you know, we, you know, so, but Pablo was the CEO. Um, it was, uh, was Pablo born into a family of crime or what did his parents not at, do? Not at all. Not at all. His mom was a school teacher. His dad was a farmer, grew, grew up poor, mm. grew up poor. And, uh, uh, you mentioned the first time he gets arrested, you know what? He was stealing hubcaps, uh, stealing, uh, headstones from graves. And then all of a sudden one kilo, two kilos. And like I said, he was responsible for 80% of the, Cocaine breaching the world. With the you know, stand up guy. There's a, there's a very <laughs> iconic photo of Pablo Escobar with his, uh, what do you call it, Steve? His uh, number. <laughs> oh, yeah, his uh, booking number. Yeah, his yeah. booking yeah. number. You'll see that photo all over the world. That's That was the first time he got arrested. Oh, okay. I, I, okay, this is a little bit off topic, but how long did it take the human race to get rid of hubcaps and just go, we can screw the wheel on flush and it'll look a lot nicer? <laughs> My first car had fucking hubcaps. Pain in the neck, those things. <laughs> to replace them and find them, they'd fall off if you break too hard. Stupid things. <laughs> we'll have to get Jay Leno back on to discuss that. Yeah, Jay Leno would have the answer for that. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so his criminal activity started. Yeah, Jim said gum. It was hubcaps and so on. Um, so he was first arrested. Uh, oh. for, uh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> gum. Gum. <laughs> um, and then, so you said it started with like a keel or two, but like, was there something that accelerated to him specifically? Or was it just, did he start out as like just a short, like, like just dealing cocaine around nightclubs or something like that? How did he get into the cocaine business? No, he started out with, with Coke. He helped uh, another guy transport several kilos and he realized how much money he can make from it. So he killed that guy. So his, <laughs> his business, uh, his business plan became violence. Wow. You know, he had no problem. Yeah, with you that. learned that at business school. But, but he did that by yeah. himself, or did he have a gang of friends that were helping him do this? Or like, because if he was just transporting coke, you kill a bloke, then you got to assume that there's people after you now. Like, how did he reign this terror? Was it? How did he get a group together? Well, these were these were low level guys, so they they weren't like big gangs. They were moving. You know, we'll say you know seventeen kilos of coke, which down there is nothing. It's like a. <laughs> It's like personal use almost, you know, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, and so there wasn't any retaliation, but the fact that he could perform that type of violence with no remorse and, and no guilt feelings, and he wasn't afraid to stand up to anybody. That's what made him so powerful. Yeah. People were afraid of him. Yeah. Was he before this, was he known as a tough guy around town or was it just a switch that went off? He, he was always known as a tough guy. And, and remember with Pablo, he had that, that charismatic, factor about him where, you know, just like a natural type of a leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, once everybody knew who Pablo was, everybody wanted to work for him. So uh, he, he was, like you said, he was known around town and he was known as, like you see mentioned, right? As a, as a kind, giving guy, but on the same breath, he'd kill you and your family in a heartbeat. Mm. Um, and at his peak, how much money did Escobar make weekly? Jim said 50 million. You know, I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> I read, uh, sorry if you don't. Yeah, I read don't something know. about it that said it was four hundred and twenty million dollars a week. What in today's we money? Making. What in today's money? Uh, I don't know if it's today's money. They said that he died with a net worth of like thirty billion dollars, which would be about sixty-four billion today. Yeah, yeah. No, Amazon. Yeah, it is <laughs> Thirty billion, and, and you know what? We we did the math. He was doing about twenty five hundred kilos a day, sending it to the wow, United States. He must have been wiped out. Yep. <laughs> and the, the kilo at that time, you know, and everybody seen the movie Scarface, right? Blow. You know that kilo was going for about eighty to a hundred thousand dollars in Miami yeah. during the mid eighties. So if you're doing twenty five hundred on a daily basis. That's a lot of money. Did it always ship in through Miami? Because Miami feels like like in the movies and stuff where it happened. Or did he have several planes and several runners doing it all over the country? Or did it just come into one point in America and then spread out? Well, initially it was South Florida. He uh, he went in and took control of South Florida. And that was, you know, using the Caribbean corridor to bring it up through that way. Um, through ships, through boats, through go fast, through uh, eventually airplanes that can't would go to far other parts of the Southeast. And then as his kingdom began to grow here in the United States, you know, he branched out from there, but South Florida was always kind of Pablo's entry into the U S 
And was he hands on with how it was going to ship across, or did he just give an order like, "I want this cocaine into America tomorrow," and the other people had to figure out the way to get it in, and if they didn't get it in, they were in trouble? Or did he actually sit down and go, "I'm putting it in Tic Tac packets." <laughs> You'd have to have a lot of Tic Tac packets. <laughs> <laughs> now he had, they had different people that were responsible for certain things. So you had a group that was uh, in charge of air transportation, a group in charge of boat transportation, a, a group that was uh, responsible for coming up with new techniques to, to hide cocaine. I mean, eventually if, uh, and you said you hadn't watched the narco show, so I'm not sure why we're on here, but maybe you'll no, promise no, no, to no, watch no. It. I never know the guests when they come on. I, 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 I did. I, I we, were, yeah. we were big yeah. fans uh, of it. Yeah. Yeah. You should uh, watch it, Jen. The I, first two seasons, there's many seasons now, but the first two seasons deal specifically with Steve and Javier and Pablo, obviously. is like that's. Is there a lot of reading involved? Yeah, I'm still I, was gonna, I was just going to say, Jim's still, not a big reader. I'm still that's wiped why. out from Squid Game. <laughs> <laughs> they showed it to us in film school. <laughs> they showed you Narcos? Mm -hmm. uh, we watched the first two episodes in the movie show. theater. It was really cool. I mean, really just good. as a side note, like when did you guys enjoy watching it? Like, did you feel like they represented you too well or? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, they got good actors. Uh, <laughs> we were, we were consultants on the first two seasons and Javier was on the third season as well. And, um, were you happy to know with who I, played you? Yeah. Yeah. They picked a redneck from Eastern Kentucky. I grew up in Tennessee and West Virginia. So I'm like a cross between a redneck and a hillbilly and uh, <laughs> Boyd Holbrook is from Eastern Kentucky. So that worked good. And Javier, you know, they picked uh, Pedro Pascal to play him yeah. and, He's a heartthrob and Javier's a man slut. So it, it worked out really good. You know? <laughs> I, I, I think I'm more handsome than Pedro Pascal, right? You yeah, are. Absolutely. So, thank you, guys. I was going to say, I mean, Pedro Pascal, yeah, he's a very good looking guy. Boyd Holbrook, not ugly, Steve, but I mean. Nice. Yeah. yeah. We stayed in touch with him. I mean, and the, the actress that played uh, played my wife, Connie, uh, Joanna Christie, she's British. And so she she was able to hide her British accent and do a really good job. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Great show. Anybody um, who hasn't seen it, you should check it out for uh, sure. The guy that plays uh, Pablo, I forget his name. Oh, oh Wagner Mora. Yeah. Yeah. That is great. He's, he's you know what, that was going to be one of my questions to y'all who played Pablo Escobar. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the fun fact about Wagner Mora, he did not know Spanish. <laughs> wow. He, he learned it upon arrival in Medellin, Colombia. He immersed oh, himself. I thought he was just saying gibberish and I wrote it down the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> yeah, but he does look a lot like him. So yeah, he like, really does. I guess. He did a great job. Did he have to gain yeah. weight or anything? Or? I'm sure, yeah, well, I don't yeah. He did. He gained 40 pounds and then he, I think he wore a fat man suit there in the... Towards the end, also. Well, that's, that's, that's Jim's dream job. Yeah, yeah, having to gain weight on purpose. Fuck, I, I, I want one of those movies where I have to get really fat. <laughs> um, why was Escobar seen as a Robin Hood type? Jim mentioned that he did put money back into the community. Is that true or is that like. Man. Well, you know what? Uh, we, we do shows all over the world and yeah, he was seen as a Robin Hood. And we always uh, this we do not agree with that uh, term. Pablo Escobar was no Robin Hood, you know. And I, I tell people, you know, did Robin Hood kill the next president of Colombia? Did Robin Hood put a bomb on a commercial airline? Of course not. I haven't yeah. seen that movie either. So this, <laughs> yeah. he did build schools, homes, but he always wanted something in return. That's why the, the Sicarios, the assassins were always, uh, like I said, he helped them out and gave them money, gave them houses. But in the end, this, you know, he would tell, Hey, go wipe out, uh, three families over there. The, the Sicarios were, you know, the first ones to do it. Wow. Did he have any, did he, how is he with the women? I got to imagine like, that Pablo did well with the women. He married right? his wife when she was 15. Mm -hmm. uh, he, hell he yeah. Got her he got her pregnant <laughs> when she was 12. Oh, so he Even was, worse. Uh, yeah, all right, I'm backing away. <laughs> he's, he was, so he's very good with the women. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Girls. Um, well, you mentioned the, the, the flight anyway, so we can, we can say that. What is notable about Avianca flight? 203 Jim said it was a smuggling plane. That's not correct, right? There was one that he hijacked and he blew up. Well, why don't you let them answer? <laughs> nah, that, that, that wasn't a smuggling plane. It, it was a commercial uh, airline going from Bogota to Cali. Pablo thought the guy who was running for president, a guy named Gaviria, was going to be on that flight. He was not on that flight. They put a bomb because he wanted to kill uh, this guy who was running for president. He was not on it. And uh, 107 innocent people were killed. 
uh, on the orders of Pablo Escobar. He's the one. I mean, he had other people place the bomb, but uh, like I said, it was no no hijacking. It was just a clear out, you know, terrorism. How do you get a job with Pablo if like if you're just a like like the, okay. Wh- when, when you watch the gangs here in LA and all that sort of stuff, they start with the little kids running the drugs and stuff like that because I've watched a few documentaries on this because those kids are under an age and they can't get arrested and then they have the teenagers and the other thing. Was it, was it like that or was it just like you were just a bloke in a bar who, you know, knew a bloke who knew a bloke? Like how did you get involved with Pablo Escobar? Did he seek you out or did you seek him out? Well, when, what Bob, what Javier was just telling you there, when he needed Sicarios, he'd go back into those barrios where he had built the houses and the clinics and the sports fields and all that. And, you know, he would, he said, Hey, I need 40 people to come and work for Pablo who are willing to kill, willing to die for me. And, you know, and the sad thing is he might have two or 300 kids, teenagers step up and want to work for Pablo. So that's how they would start. Mm. Uh, I think, Popeye, who was one of his famous Sicarios uh, who died of cancer here just a couple years ago, said that he approached Pablo and, you know, wanted to work for him and, and he had to test him out. He had to know where he came from and that kind of thing. But uh, those were the, that's like the murdering group, the smugglers themselves, they would start their own organizations. And then, you know, <laughs> it'd be like the Godfather, Pablo would make them an offer they couldn't refuse and they'd come in under the Medellin cartel umbrella. Oh, right, right, right. See. You start up a restaurant, and then McDonald's buys you out. It's kind yeah. of like an MLM. You you start. You can be your own boss. You just get three people underneath you, and they each get three people underneath them. Now, then you get yeah. rich. Now, now this <laughs> this is something I don't understand. So so obviously he was wanted by the Colombian government, or he probably paid off a lot of people or whatever. How did he stay so protected? I assume he had big houses. It wasn't like Osama bin Laden where we didn't know where he was, or did we not know where he was? You know what? That's a great question. At at the beginning, obviously, because Pablo was part of Congress, Colombian con- congressman, mm-hmm. he wanted to be president. But there was a, another congressman who found out Pablo was a drug trafficker, so they kicked him out. It, and really, the the search for Pablo starts in about, oh, I would say right around 85, 86 in going, you know, after him, after the the Avianca bombing, after and then you know he did kill a a guy who was running for president, who was going to be the president of Colombia. Once he killed that person, you know, then the all all out war started on Pablo Escobar. And uh, at at the beginning, it, it it was hard. People were protecting him. They were hiding him. We had information. We were really never able to locate him. So he, he was in hiding, but he had a lot of help from government officials. Uh, there was some corruption, uh, but, you know, the main thing were people wanting to hide Escobar for money. But if he's being hid for money and he's worth $30 billion, money money doesn't buy you happiness, especially if you're fucking hiding all the time. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, what's the point of all this? I don't understand why someone doesn't just stop at a billion and go, oh, <laughs> I did all right. I'll just give it a rest right now. I guess it, was it all power for him or did he want to pass something onto his children or what, what was, what was his motivation? Uh, his, his ego had gone out of control. You know, he, he not only wanted to be a member of Congress, he wanted to be the president of Columbia. Yeah. He offered to pay off their national debt to the tune of about $211 billion two different times if they would leave him alone. Um, he just, it was the power and the ego thing just got to him. The greed factor. He I t- wanted everybody I- to bow down to the great Pablo. He pretty much like his biggest thing was he didn't want to be extradited to the United States. Right. Like he, he was like, I'll stay here and, you know, hide out in these houses, but I don't want to go to United States jail. <laughs> but he was going to pay off their national debt. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not condoning what yeah, he he's, did. he's murdered all these people. Jim. I know, but if he, Offered to fix the potholes in my street, I would listen to him. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like national debt in a poor country. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. But then the threat's always looming. Well, he'll just murder whoever he, you know. If like, let what if the in the president of the United States? Yeah, but that's what you do. You go, all right, you pay off the national debt. Bring us the bag of money at this address. Then you, you kill him and you take the bag of money. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a setup. <laughs> and you hit it right on the head by with the extradition. A lot of people don't realize that was his beef with the United States. He did not want to get extradited. His war, his terrorism war, 
was because of extradition. So I'm glad you brought that up. A lot of people think it was, you know, money, dope. Now the, the war started because they were trying to extradite him to the United States. And that's what, you know, the terrorism was all about. What was his food of choice? <laughs> we, <laughs> I always wonder this with billionaires because Bill Gates' favorite meal is a cheeseburger. Right? A and he's got all the money in the world. Uh, Bandeja Paisa. It's very famous. It's, oh, I love it, but it's real filling. It's, it's a white rice, a plantain. It's a pork, like a rib with a lot of fat on it. It's great. The uh, piece of meat, they put an egg over it. Man, you eat that once and your cholesterol is going to yeah, be good. good. It sounds like, like a bing, bang, bop. Luis is drooling right yeah, now. Sounds good. Yeah. What is it called? Bande- what is it called? Bandeja Paisa. I'm very famous. It's a question. great dish, but it's just real. <laughs> like, is it a lot of, a lot of good stuff in it that's bad for you? That's what we're it's eating. Supposed, Jack. It's supposed to we're represent everything that. you can get on the farm. Everything yeah. you get on the farm. All right. Um. So uh, we'll jump across to this question too, though. So, um, how sure. did the government and the DEA agents, you guys, track Escobar? Jim said, "Find my phone and the, the spy on the inside." He said, "Javier, you were on the inside." You were on the inside, Javier. Yeah, that's what he were said. Were you on the inside? Right. <laughs> I'm on the inside. <laughs> nah, nah, we weren't on the side. And it, it was the radio intercepts, basically. We had a lot of informants who were telling us where he was, but basically towards the end, it's a, we're monitoring his uh, telephone. And it, it wasn't the regular telephone like we use now. It was, uh, you know, Steve says it better. It's a, it's a radio telephone. Uh, we had the frequency. And, uh, and it's a great story because at the end, Juan Pablo, who is Pablo's son, is talking to dad, Pablo Escobar, right? He's giving him direct, I mean, instructions on what to do. And the other team that's intercepting him is our boss in Medellin, Colonel Martinez. And the person who is intercepting him is his son, Lieutenant Hugo Martinez. I mean, that's, wow. you can't get better for a movie than that. You know, <laughs> good, good guy, uh, father, son, Colonel Martinez, his son, Lieutenant, who's DFing, triangulating, and it's Pablo talking to his son, Juan Pablo. Wow. You're you're clearly very brave men to go up against a guy who killed. Were you ever in fear of your lives? Did you feel protected? Do you feel in fear of your lives now? Uh, Well, I don't think. We don't think we're very brave. We were just doing a job down there. The uh, We were in fear for our lives every day that after Pablo escaped that very next day, Javier and I lived in Medellin for the next 18 months with the Colombian National Police and going out on operations every day and talking to informants and just doing the things that you do. Um, we did feel protected. Uh, you know, a couple of things. Uh, I'm a Christian, I believe, and a good man upstairs took care of us. Mm-hmm. The uh, We worked with a very elite group of Colombian police officers that when the shit hit the fan, they wouldn't run off and leave you. But because of the mutual respect, they knew we wouldn't run away either. Uh, and we were a hell of a lot younger back then. <laughs> <laughs> but when you say you lived in Medellin for uh, for 18 months, yeah, you say. Know, so After he escaped from jail, they're yeah, saying, yeah. I know it's an all-encompassing job and you don't work nine to five and all that type of stuff. But you, you must have had some downtime every now and again. Did you guys you have to just go out in the town and get yourself some pork with an egg with a plantain or what? Or, or, or were you always just like, I'll, I'll say the safe of house. Of course we did. We had to. Come on, man. We had a little bar called Candileja. And all the neighborhood people knew us. It was just right outside the base. We'd be there. Of course, who would buy all the cop beers and burgers? We did. So that's why we were pretty well known. But and, yeah, we had to go out, man. And, and, and this is a really weird question. I don't, I don't know if you've probably been asked this one before, but how much cocaine have you held in your hands at one time? Javier's I mean, got the record, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, we did uh, 10 tons of cocaine. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, how much space is cocaine. that? How big is that volume? And you know what? It was hit inside a hole, just buried inside a hole. And then once we found that, we found like, I think it was three or four more, more holes but we had like 40 tons of cocaine. <laughs> how, 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 what does that look like in size? Uh, 40 tons. It, it's, it's about, uh, if you, and then they were, they were packaged in bales. 
with a burlap sacks. Each sack had about, I don't know, 40, 50 kilos. So it, it, it was about, I don't know, 50 yards in length, about two, three feet high. You know? 50 uh, yards in like two, three feet so high. The, wow. the, 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 moral, the moral of the story, and this is, you know, was, you know, we'd seize a hundred keys in Miami. Steve was in Miami. We'd be celebrating all night. Hey, look at this. You think Pablo Escobar cared? He's got 40, 50 tons. Right. In yeah. the <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. Did you, ever, you guys ever crack into a package and try out the product? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I wanted to ask that, but I've got more decorum, Kelly. <laughs> we, we assume they did. <laughs> yeah, you got to celebrate well, somehow. Like, like if there's 50 feet, two street high, you got to take one sack over there. <laughs> no, yeah, I, no, we did not. But, but, but here's, here's the thing. You must, it must have been weird going back to your wife to say this sentence, oh, God, me back hurts. I've been lifting cocaine all day. <laughs> Yeah, no, we had other guys that would do that. Thank uh, goodness. Yes. Yeah, the interns. <laughs> Go there, the That's what they're for, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a Coke lifter for the DEA. <laughs> um, I get coffees and lift Coke. <laughs> let's uh, let's do some ads. Do some ads. Is there something in fearing in interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Uh, yeah. Look, you know, I've been under a lot of pressure lately. New baby. Uh, a lot of cancelled jobs and stuff like that. You know, I, I found the Christmas period rather hard. I went booming. Mm -hmm. Had to go to therapy 2022 again. 2022 is off to, to a rough start too. I had to start go back to my therapy. I let it lapse for a while and I just, it's it's like anything. You, you, you leave your mental health alone and it will diminish. You need to keep tinkering with it and cleaning it and make sure that it's good like any possession. And your mental health is one of your most important things. Better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not a self-help. It's a professional counseling done securely online. The service is available to clients worldwide and you can log into your account anytime to send your message to your counselor. You'll get a timely and thoughtful responses. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counsellors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counselling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit betterhelp.com slash IDK, that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and the I Don't Know About That listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash IDK. That's betterhelp.com slash IDK. So we yeah. kind of skipped ahead. I asked Jim, what is uh, Cathedral? And then yeah, Cathedral. Cat Cathedral, yeah, I'm fucking mispronouncing. Um, and then uh, maybe we can talk about when he surrendered to the government, like just about that kind of time. Because you said he, when he got out of jail, when he escaped jail, let's talk about that a little, I guess, what that was. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll let me. La Catedral was his so-called prison, which was not. It was, uh, it was fancy, looked like a prison from the outside, but inside it was just luxurious apartments. He even built, he was building chalets, they call them, on the side of the mountain where he was at, entertaining. The so-called prison had a bar, a drinking bar. Uh, women would come in, you know, uh, left and right. So it, it, it was no no prison. It was his, they called it La Catedral. It was a country club setting. Everything luxurious, the big TVs, everything was just a luxury setting uh, for him. And, and this was after he surrendered, right? He surrendered to the government. Is that right? Right. right. He surrendered. Yeah. And part of the condition was nobody from the government could go visit him. So there was no chance. So he hired his own prison guards. He uh, <laughs> uh, hired his own prison guards. And his sentence was about what? Five years, Steve, right? Mm -hmm. Basically. Five years. Five years. And uh, nobody can come and visit him at the so-called prison. He brought in his own sicarios, about seven guys. They could protect him. And so, you know, he had it made. But like we talked about that greed, and that's what he led to the escape was the greed. He thought a couple of his guys were stealing money from him, and he had them killed. And that's where we basically came in. Were, were there other prisoners in this prison, or was he the only prisoner? 
It was Pablo and 13 others that he handpicked. So, you know, he paid for this prison. So, you know, it was nice. Yeah. Yeah, He had a, he had a two room suite. He had a fireplace. He had a jacuzzi tub in his private bathroom. I mean, all the other presents we've seen around the world, uh, they have what they call group showers. <laughs> and uh, is this, this prison now, is it a hotel or a, uh, is it a theme park? Nah, the, you know what? Uh, we went back, well, during the filming of uh, of uh, Narcos. So I took the guys for the prison. They converted it into a monastery. I wish they would have kept it museum type uh, just so that people could see, but they, they converted it into a... a you know, a monastery. With the TV show and with all the interest and different movies and all that type of stuff, um, is there is there Escobar tourism now in Colombia where people go and, you know, they, they see what happened and all that type of stuff? Or? Oh, yeah. They've got the narco tours down there. So you can – they'll give you a tour up to the prison. They'll give you a tour out to his, his famous ranch, Hacienda Napoles, where the hippos and all the other animals live. Um, they, the Colombian government actually blew up – the Monaco building, which was an eight story condo building in, in the Poblado section of Medellin, which is a rich section uh, to try to get rid of some of that, you know, tourist narco tourism dollars. They're not proud of it. Medellin is, is one of the most beautiful places you ever go. It's just a beautiful city. The people there are, are really nice. Is it safe to travel down there now on holiday? And do they have a, you know, an 800 seat theater that would do comedy? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they do. It is safe. Uh, believe it or not, my, uh, my oldest son and, and his wife, they vacation once a year with friends. And uh, I sent them to Cartagena here a couple of years ago and they fell in love with the place. Um, I mean, I've been back to Medellin to film one show down there several years ago. We didn't stay very long, but uh, it was just so much nicer than what we remembered when we were there. Yeah. And, and how it, did they clean the place up? Was it, is it just the law enforcement's better there now or is it the drugs no, are gone? No, yeah, the city itself, the mayor, very progressive. They cleaned it up. Yeah. They had uh, a, a metro system, which wasn't there when we were there. It's a very cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan modern city, and we encourage people to go visit. It's the flower capital of the world. The biggest, uh, like I said, they're, they're known for producing flowers, and uh, they have a, a once a year a big uh, party. You know, uh, the food is great. Uh, like they got those narco tours. You know what? The only caveat we tell people and we do it in our shows is, you know, visit, enjoy. It's a beautiful city, but do not bat mouth Pablo Escobar in the city of Medellin. Yeah. Still to this day. People that think he's at Robin Hood. So mm-hmm. I just tell them, just don't say nothing. Don't bat mouth him. Because there's still right. a lot of people that love him. There. Um, all right. right. So, um, Where are we so, going, Jack? So what... Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, Plato or Plomo? I asked Jim what that was, and he, um, I don't even remember what the answer Death was. Death or life. He said. Death or life. What was that about with Pablo Escobar? That was pretty close. It's uh, it's Spanish for silver or lead. Silver in the form of money or lead in the form of a bullet. Oh, wow. <laughs> you were close. Yeah. Actually, it was close. I didn't think about that, but yeah, you were, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what was, what did that mean? Like, why did, what that was something he had said or he was... What you want to tell the story? Jake? Yeah, the- yeah he, he came up with that phrase, and and believe me, it caught on real fast. And I was in Medellin when that phrase came on. And the story is a couple of sicarios, assassins, going to this judge's office, say, Judge, we have a briefcase here. We're being sent by Mr. Pablo Escobar. Sir, we have $100,000 in this briefcase. All you have to do to accept, you know, and accept it is drop the charges against Mr. Escobar. Mr. Escobar. This money is yours. The judge kicked him out of the office. The next morning, they killed the judge, his wife, and his two kids. Oh. From, from there on, it was known as, you want plata or plomo? You want a bullet or you want some money? From then on, people started accepting briefcases that were sent by Pablo Escobar. If not, they kill them and their family. Well, that's it's not a hard choice, is it? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like he could go or, death or nothing. At least yeah. he's giving you a death cash option. Money. <laughs> yeah, death or money. <laughs> like, that's like, what I was wondering. Were you guys ever worried that any of your informants or the police that were protecting you might get paid off by him and turn on you? Or was did you guys feel pretty secure in your security there and, and were you did anyone ever try to bribe you 
No, the, uh, we did feel pretty secure working with the police, uh, informants. You can never trust them that they're snitching on somebody. They'll snitch on you <laughs> the first opportunity. They'll set you up for, you know, they'll do anything for money. Uh, we did feel safe there working, but we worked with a very elite group of Colombian national police officers that, I mean, these are guys we, we would fly out on the gunships. We would do surveillance with them. We'd eat in the same restaurants, sleep in the same barracks. You know, this, we were with these guys all the time. Uh, and those are the guys that actually took down Pablo when he was finally killed. So right. it was, he put a, you know, Pablo put a bounty out on us, $300,000 each. Um, that's a little bit disconcerting wow. <laughs> to start with, but, yeah. um, you know, you just, you kind of get used to it. Yeah. Oh, it. it. I'm glad it was the same price for both of you. <laughs> <laughs> there, there well, been a, two for one. Yeah. It wasn't a two for one. There would have been a bit of tex, um, tension if one was worth a million and then a oh, hundred thousand yeah. bucks. Yeah. <laughs> So, I'm there is a funny, funny story. When I first get there in 88, you know, uh, I get a call from my boss over here. Are you at the apartment? I say, yeah, get out of there. You know, just, you know, haul ass back to the embassy. Uh, there's a car just coming to get you. And, you know, they find out where I live. So, I mean, I took off, went back to the embassy. But all the government did was they changed. They got me another apartment. So I was safe. Oh, <laughs> Doesn't sound stressful at all. <laughs> Not at all. Walk in the park. Hey, we, we uh, used to have hair. <laughs> where, where, where did Pablo keep his money because it feels like a lot of money in bags and you're saying 30 billion dollars what banks were working with him or was it swiss bank accounts or where, where did he keep his money you know what that that's a great question and uh there's been uh several documentaries that have uh he kept it in, in holes in the ground collectors basically at the beginning he didn't believe in the banking system towards the end they started doing a couple of, of, of the banks but at the beginning they used to hide it i mean hide it in in plain uh just uh they dig a hole they uh, they call them collectors the problem was that pablo would have the guy who hit the money they would have him killed mm. so only pablo knew where the money was. Now that Pablo's dead, there is still a lot of money buried in Colombia. Oh, wow. I don't think, wow, there have been a lot of, uh, you know, expeditions trying to get that money. I don't think they're going to discover it. It's, 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 you know, some of it has been weathered away. You know, the weather has washed it away. Mm. Uh, there was one incident, an old man who was milking cows right by the river started seeing bags. So he started grabbing some bags. So we interviewed him. I think he got like, I don't know, four or 500,000. We let him keep the money. But he said, there's a lot more bags coming by. We asked him, why didn't you get them? He said, I had to go back to milk, the, finish milking the cows. <laughs> hey, priorities, priorities. Yeah, Isn't it it's amazing that Pablo Escobar only dealt in cash? Like, you know, have all the fucking money in the world, but you can't buy something on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> it, says, it says here, according to his brother, about 10% or 2.1 billion was written off annually. A, uh, annually, uh, because it was e eaten by rats or destroyed by the elements. Two point uh, one billion dollars. That came from his brother Roberto. Yeah, it's probably a lie. No, he's a. You know, uh, he's an idiot. He's a freaking idiot. Yeah. <laughs> How do you really feel? And is, and, is, and is he still alive? Is is, is yeah. Pablo's like what? Are, what are Pablo's kids doing now? Uh, well, his son is on the speaking circuit like we are, uh, traveling all around the world. He's got a bigger following than we do. Mm. Um, the daughter, we don't know much about her, and we never have really uh, spent much time with her. She was very, very young, you know, when the Los Pepes, and they blew up the the Monaco building trying to kill the family, and she lost hearing in one ear. And mm -hmm. Just, you know, it's a horrible story for a little kid to go through. But um, the brother, somebody sent him a letter bomb when he was in prison, so he's uh, – blind and partially deaf, but he sits at the front. I understand he sits at the front gate of Hacienda Napoli's for the narco tours. Uh, and if you want, you know, if you're willing to give him, you know, 15, 20 bucks, he'll take a picture with you, that kind of crap. <laughs> All right. But Wait. in his, his book, he takes a lot of credit for stuff he did do. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the he son. Was not the accountant. <laughs> he, he wrote a, a bullshit book. A buddy of mine went to the narco tour not too long ago in Medellin. And I didn't know that. And so he said, hey, have you heard uh, Roberto's book? So anyway, I, I forgot about it. I had it in my desk. It, it fell the other day. And I didn't know that. But Roberto wrote a note to me. <laughs> Basically, Javier Pena, hey, uh, bygones, bygones. Uh, but let the truth and justice come forward. I forgive you, basically. He told oh, me. <laughs> uh, bullshit. Bullshit. Now, now, oh, Steve's oh. upstairs. It's bullshit. Is that, yeah, Steve. 
fired up oh, over there. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> oh. uh, I wanted to ask real quick. His son, because he's speaking towards Pablo Escobar, does he kind of romanticize his father or does he think that, yeah, he was the. Depends speaks, where he's talking to, I'm sure. Speaks <laughs> about the violence of his, or, you know, do you know or. Well, I, I don't know what he talks about. I know he did start the uh, the false rumor that his father committed suicide rather than being killed by the Columbia National Police, and you know he tries to justify it's uh, it's bullshit. <laughs> uh, we did have we were doing a Northern European tour several years ago, and our agent called and says, "Hey, uh, you know Juan Pablo's in I don't know Sweden or Finland, wherever he was, and you guys are going there. Would you go on stage with him?" It's oh, like uh, not no, but hell no. Yeah. You know, we're, yeah, I read we I read somewhere session. that he had like initially considered like continuing on with the family business and then kind of had a change of heart and became this like guy who goes on speaking tours. So it's, uh, he probably just wasn't as good as his dad, I guess. Well, yeah, Cal, yeah. Callie would have killed him if he tried to carry on the business, oh. the Cali cartel. Wow. Okay. So there, there are still cartels in like, so my question, what, what happened to all the farms? Like, okay. First of all, when you go, oh, we found these drugs under the ground. Isn't it easier to find a farm that is growing the cocaine plant, or like we did an episode on this? Remember? I know, but I can't remember. <laughs> so, what happened to all the land where all the cocaine was made? What happened there? Well, the, the 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 cocaine basically, you know, the plant came from Bolivia, Peru. You know, the you know the the Indians use it for their you know mate for tea, medicinal purposes. However, once you bring the uh, what is it the the raw material back to Colombia, they would process process it into the powder form. And this is where we used to see the humongous cocaine labs. This lab for producing a thousand kilos of cocaine on a daily basis. So there is still coca plants uh, in Colombia. They're trying to eradicate them. I mean, everybody's still growing them. It's still, you know, there's a lot of religious, medicinal uh, purposes. But uh, going back to the farms that Pablo Escobar had, pretty much after he was killed, all the other traffickers stole them. Uh, you, you know, I think we mentioned Los Pepes, which, you know, that was a very uh, deadly group. They stole a lot. The Cali cartel hated Pablo. So basically other traffickers stole all of their properties. Mm. Yeah, that's season three. So, <laughs> How many deaths do the estimate Escobar is responsible for? Jim said 2,000. Well, we say 10 to 15, but 10 to 15,000, but... Um... That guy we talked about earlier, Popeye, the Sicario, and Popeye was in prison with Pablo. So this is a guy that would know. Uh, he <laughs> he was on a documentary that we were on, and uh, he said he laughed at our number. He said the number is more like fifty thousand people that Pablo Escobar was responsible Holy for killing. Christ. But that means that he was killing a few people a day. Like every day, he's like, oh, "Kill that guy, kill that." They blew yeah, up a no. plane, you know. Yeah. yeah, no, that was a big. That was a that, that was racks a, up that, quick. That was a that was a big day. Right. <laughs> if you look at the at the terrorism, you know, the airplane, there was buildings he was blowing up that were hundreds of people inside. Then the car bombs, car bombs were being placed about 10 to 15 on a daily basis. Oh, and that's where a lot of innocent people were getting killed. Women, women, children just going to the mall. He placed them at the mall. He put one at a bookstore where parents were going to buy their books. Well, I would have so, been safe. <laughs> it, it was his, his deal was try to kill as many people as possible. That way, the government would negotiate with him. Okay. Oh. So he must have had like a bomb making place as well. Like just like that would have been next to these cocaine. How big were the cocaine manufacturing warehouses? How big were they? Like you know, like square feet or whatever football no, field or the, whatever. The laboratories. Yeah, the the, labor, the cocaine laboratories were humongous if you could picture i mean we have pictures uh but it's it's there in the jungle it'd be a platform i don't know uh 500 feet by 500 feet they had roofs they had sleeping quarters there'd be about 100 people working they had dormitories they had work schedules it was like a little little town and uh, you know, uh, it, it'd be they even had a recycling plant for the chemicals. You know, to make cocaine, you need all sorts of nasty chemicals. So he was recycling them uh, at at this time. So put, I mean, then we would we would count the people. It'd be about a hundred people per lab, and the guy had about ten labs. That's why all the cocaine 
was being manufactured there. Okay, so whenever I take meetings at Netflix, they have like a little, uh, they have free food there for the staff and everything like that. They have an ice cream room where you go in. And, you, and, and I always get myself, whenever I go to Netflix, I go, I've got to get me ice cream. So I go in the room, there's every ice cream you can imagine. The staff look at me like, you can't do that every day, man. You know? Anyway, <laughs> it, what I'm saying is, with all the staff working there, were they told not to take cocaine or there was so much of it that it was like, have at it, boys. We need <laughs> staff that are going to work quick and fast. <laughs> you know what? And I'm going to go against that one. Every cocaine lab that was assigned, it said, if I catch you using the product, I will kill you, signed Pablo Escobar. So he didn't want his guys to be using it. Oh, really? I would have a sign that say, you sniff it, you bought it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So how did he die? And when Jim thought that Steve killed him six years ago, I don't think that's correct. No, I got mixed up. Steve killed someone else six years ago. (laughs) (laughs) It was those boys coming around trying to date my daughter. Oh, I didn't know. Um, no, on December 2nd, 1993 is when Lieutenant Martinez was able to triangulate and find where Pablo's phone was. And as he's driving down the street, he sees Pablo looking out the window. So this elite group of Columbia police officers that we worked with, uh, they were in the area. They went over and launched an operation. They got in a gun battle. Uh, Pablo tried to jump out the third floor window of a row house onto the roof of a two story behind him. Uh, and the cops were down there and he's shooting at him. They catch him in a crossfire. And so he was killed by the Columbia National Police. And I, one thing I'd like to point out is if you watch the narco series, it shows that I was on the roof when Pablo was killed. That's not true. I was back at the base. So this was a straight out. There were no American operators, no American military there, no DE agents. This was the Columbia National Police taking their country back. Did you guys ever talk to Pablo? Did you ever get on the phone with him and have a chat? Like, we know where you are, dickhead. Did you ever do any <laughs> of that? Listened to, we listened to him a lot of times. I, I No, and I met his family, yes. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, we knew the family. In fact, uh, I took them out of an airplane. They were coming to Miami. How they got U.S. visas, we'll never know. Uh, but, you know, not, not a person. We never talked to him, no. And then how many people attended his funeral? Do we know this? It, Jim said six. He went for the low number. <laughs> Yeah, it, it might have been 6,000. Right, was, right, right. It was thousands showed up, thousands. Yeah. Mm. Very because you had just meant you mentioned earlier, I think, Javier, you mentioned. Hell of a party afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Going to one of these holes. <laughs> yeah, two days afterwards, the whole town was sad. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, so this is a part of the show where we ask our guests to provide us with a dinner party fact, something our listeners and viewers can use to impress people about our, this subject if they were like at a dinner party or a bar or something. So what do you got for us? Okay. <laughs> who, who was Pablo Escobar's right-hand man that never got the credit? Oh, mm. who, uh, I'm going to say Dean Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was his uh, first cousin, Gustavo Gaviria. And he appears on the Netflix show. He was the guy, the, uh, the brains of the cartel, because he had the the routes, the cocaine routes to Mexico, to Miami, dealt with General Noriega. This guy was actually the guy who was planning uh, the loads. Is Gaviria like a super popular name in Colombia? Because that was the the guy who yeah. was supposed to be president, right? Yeah. And who was president, Cesar Gaviria. Oh, okay. Yeah, but they didn't... weren't related. Yeah, Gustavo Gaviria. He was killed. Uh, by the by, the police. Uh, he didn't want to surrender. Comes out with a machine gun. So How he, much cocaine did Sevilla Vergara um, get into America? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. What do you know? What do you know, there, Jim? I don't know. I don't know. Bring him in the implants. Yeah. <laughs> He's making a movie. I understand uh, portraying Griselda Blanco. Yeah, yeah, that's the modern family cartel. (laughs) All right, Steve. Um, So, yeah, just uh, thank you for being here, Uh, Steve and Javier. I just wanted to reiterate one more time. DEANarcos.com is the website. Go ahead and buy the book there, Manhunters, How We Took Down Pablo Escobar. You can get an autographed copy on the website there. Um, And listen to the podcast, Game of Crimes Podcast at GameofCrimesPodcast.com. Guys, thanks for being on the podcast. This was uh, fascinating. I'm going to watch Narcos now, so I'll be ready for the next time I have to do a podcast on it. Uh, <laughs> let's, 
That's the best news we've heard all night. Thank you guys for having us on here with Thank you. Thank you so much. Fun. This is fun. Uh, we had fun also. We also had fun. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, if you've you ever had a party and you and you say uh, Pablo Escobar, he was a Robin Hood type character, go, well, I don't know about that, and then run away. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Australia. 